and a lot of it now is like old hat, nonlinear. Ooh. Um, so, anyways, good morning. Yes, I'm here to talk about ATSC. I've got my ATSC three socks on, and as Mark Richer said at lunch today, that we are on solid footing. All right. Uh, okay. So. Yeah, it wasn't bad. I thought we got a chuckle at lunch. Okay. Where's the clicker? Or is it just the arrow? Okay. Uh, so anyways, all right. So, Capital Broadcasting, who are we? For those of you who don't know who we are, we are a small but scrappy group. Uh, we have three call letter stations total. Uh, but we're doing uh, 10 program streams out of our facility in Raleigh. There's 3.1s, 3.2s, a dot three. We're also doing some geo-targeted for uh, a couple of areas in our market. We're doing uh, stuff that's cleared for the web only. We have an OTT channel with multiple subsets to the OTT channel now. Um, one of the claims to fame is, of course, that uh, they, I was not there at the time. Um, I was fixing beta machines in 1996. Um, had the uh, uh, the first commercial broadcast or first commercial license for uh, ATSC 1.0, uh, and then in uh, Super Bowl Sunday of 2001, they launched everything field to studio in uh, HD. So, coming home, you're right. This doesn't keep up. Uh, coming home from NAB a year ago, I had the ever fateful words from uh, Mr. Goodman uh, when he says, "Peter, I've been thinking," which is never good. It always turns into work for me. Uh, to put 3.0 on the air. So we came home from NAB and we put together what we call the Channel 39 Club. There is a motley crew of people there, uh, a lot of which are in this room as we speak. Um, so in no particular order, actually, I didn't quite know how to do it, so I actually did this at the year I breakfast at NAB. I made it look like a tower. So that's, <laughs> I, it, 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 alphabetical's boring. But uh, ERI, What's that? Yeah, yeah, I need a lightning rod. Um, so obviously, the, you, know, you could read for yourself. I won't read through it. Uh, there's no point in, in going that deep. So anyways, this is just, I'm going to go through a little bit of uh, the equipment that came in, some of the testing we did, uh, some of the testing we're going to do, and some odd thoughts that have come up along the way. But this was the, uh, the Gates Maxiva transmitter showing up. And luckily, it wasn't raining that day. Um, ERI antenna going up, uh, Matt Brandis, my transmitter supervisor, Joe Molesky, uh, and uh, everything being stacked on the tower. Uh, again, just a couple more shots of it all going up. Um, ERI, um, uh, Nick Pollan made our first field tunable uh, UHF um, mass filter, uh, and I always love when we get a serial number with our call letters on it. Uh, so here, there's three different shots I put on the same page, just to, to keep it down. So on the left is uh, what I call the, um, the Gazinta bits. The middle is the Gozota RF, and the end is uh, taking a look at it. So on the left, of course, is uh, we, when we first launched, everything was at the transmitter site. Uh, HVC encoding, the uh, playback, the deinterlacer, the dash packaging. Uh, the route encoding, the ESG, um, all the goodies there are on the left. In the middle is the transmitter. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the input of an ATSC 1 or 3.0 into a transmitter, it scared me. It was an Ethernet cable. There were two of them. Uh, and on the right is uh, the ETL, the, uh, the Rodian Schwartz ETL. And interestingly, we don't throw anything out. That is the 8VSB demodulator from uh, the Grand Alliance for ATSC 1.0 that we're using as a shelf. <laughs> but you can't throw it out. Uh, a little more nostalgia. So we still have the original Mitsubishi encoder and decoder uh, that was sitting on the transmitter. So when we did the 3.0 launch, we actually used the, um, uh, the decoder the, uh, as the uh, uh, stand for the 3.0 um, LG set that uh, was decoding the, uh, the first round. We're on the air. Uh, that's Dave Catapano, Joe Cecilia, and Nick Paulin, uh, Trivini, Gates, and ERI. Uh, and that's Monica in the little picture down the bottom, but nobody knows Monica. Uh, we also did a thank you for the AWARN and uh, advanced emergency alerting plug wherever you went to sit. 
Um, yes, so the work we did in MH on mobile EAS, a lot of that work is ported straight over into um, 3.0. So when we launched last year, we were actually able to do a 3.0 demonstration of the uh, advanced emergency alerting, including the um, being able to type uh, information in through the Monroe DASDEC. So it was live and on the air. That's rich media on the right-hand side that we were putting in. That isn't actually part of the broadcast. And um, that's uh, Catherine Brown, who I believe used to be in this market. So if anybody realizes we stole her. Uh, a little more of the pomp and pageantry of the day. You know, all that goes on. Uh, more of the Motley crew putting it all together. That's the room. Um, this room uh, serves twofold. This is our disaster recovery room. Yeah, we didn't put it in the cloud, we put it in a transmitter. Uh, and on the right is actually where all that, uh, the picture of the, uh, uh, the equipment was for the uh, scheduler, encoder, um, all that. Uh, dinner and beer. Gotta have beer. And no, don't worry, I won't go past five o'clock so you can all get beer. Uh, when we launched, uh, we're actually we still are channel 39. It's a directional pattern towards the metro uh, We went as um, high as we could in uh, power, but we were limited by just interference uh, So we dumped as much um, V pole into it as we could uh, To help fill it up. I the jury is obviously still at how much V pole is enough V pole uh, We're obviously running uh, quite a bit on that one. It was at 1700 feet uh, This is the pattern towards the market um, the actual metro of Raleigh does fit within this, so this 40 kilowatt is actually working really quite well. Um, and we affectionately call this the Tweety Bird pattern. Uh, just a list of all the equipment, I'm not going to read it to you, you would all fall asleep. Uh, signal flow pattern, we, you know, there's been enough conversation by a lot of people a lot smarter than I am today on how all of this goes together. A lot of the things that we realize we do at RAL is we're not developing the standard per se or trying to make uh, make the boxes work. What we do is we take the systems and put it together and work with the vendors to, to, to get the system to work. We're a little more real world than we are scientific um, and we kind of bounce off the rails that way. Uh, so when we first launched, um, it was decided, actually Joe Cecilia decided, to come up with a uh, mod cod that would give us as close to a 15 dB signal to noise as we could for obvious reasons. Uh, and these were all hard-coded in to the system at the time. We did not have a scheduler when we first launched. Um, but that, uh, that setup there gave us, uh, apparently I didn't put the data rate on there, it, about 26 megabits of data uh, as the payload. So for the same DB, we were all, oh, there it is, yeah. We were getting, uh, you know, the better part of pushing 30% more just with the same right over the top. Uh, we launched day one. We had two encoders until Harmonic took the second one home. They wouldn't leave us their toys. Uh, but they left us with one. Uh, but the first day we launched with um, two different programs, one PLP. Actually, it wasn't even PLP at the time. It was just a signal. Um, but uh, they were both live encoded uh, products. One, we deinterlaced our uh, standard NBC feed. Um, in the, or our standard WRAL. We're an NBC affiliate. So our standard WRAL feed, we deinterlaced it. Uh, and, and broadcast that in HEVC, and then we did, uh, we had a player, just a uh, key pro player, the new, the new key pro player that would do um, HDR uh, out. So we rolled that out as well, because we launched a uh, doc unit, um, in, uh, we did a documentary in um, um, Sony SLOG 3 in uh, uh, HDR 10 uh, the year before this. <coughs> Then, following that, they took their encoder home, so we actually did a PCAP, a packet capture of the, uh, the Bulls documentary. We just rolled that back through using, um, injecting it into the route encoder. Right on the heels of that, NBC was gracious enough to let us broadcast uh, the, uh, the Olympics in 4K. Um, obviously, nobody was really worried about the rights problems there. I had the TV, the. Uh, Wayne took it back. <laughs> um, but uh, it actually worked quite well. So I don't know if anybody recalls NBC, uh, they did the opening ceremonies in uh, HDR, they did, it was an HDR 10. And then they did um, a number of sports events throughout the, uh, throughout the 17 days of just straight 4K uh, SDR. Um, as we'll talk about in a little bit, um, 
shortly, there's still a lot of learning going on about live production and HDR. Uh, so just before NAB, we were running a couple of, uh, we, we got our scheduler, we set up a couple of PLPs, uh, we decided to run um, uh, one at 15 dB signal noise best we could and see how far we could push a second one. I mean, a lot of the testing we've been doing has been random. It's uh, Matt and I and a couple other guys, Mike at the station, sitting there going, well, what, what's a realistic thing we should test? It's not nearly as scientific as Tim. Um, we, Like I said, we kind of try to do stuff that we, we realize is, is going to make sense um, based on the information we're getting from guys that are doing the heavy lifting. Um, just shots of the scheduler, if anybody really wanted to know the real details of what was set up, how we'd set it up and running. Uh, and then about three weeks ago, we got our LDM um, layer or the enhanced layer to work. Uh, so we've been playing with that lately. So we're running um, on the uh, robust core layer, we're, uh, we're running uh, WRAL still. WRAL has been on nonstop since a year ago, over a year ago now. And we're running the two PCAP uh, files. Uh, we also have a, uh, a local um, show that we shoot called Out and About. It's kind of a, um, uh, like a drive-ins, dives, and diners. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that. I'm probably breaking some sort of copyright thing there. But, uh, it's kind of cool. It's a kind of eclectic, neat thing. Uh, so to test all this, we had to build up our own stuff. Um, we, had, <laughs> we had the production, or the, uh, uh, creative Services Department abandoned this little Honda element, but they had put an inverter in it and uh, had some rack space in it. They had an Xbox in it when they bought it. Uh, so we slapped an antenna on it and put uh, uh, the Trivini screen, stream scope in it. We put a uh, deck tech uh, running their ATSC expert in it, and we started driving around to see if it worked. Uh, and the zoo is what they actually called it. The car is called the zoo, of which if you've ever been in a newsroom, that's pretty accurate. Um, so to do a lot of the, there's a lot of conversation about why do you do 3.0, there's everything that's been talked about all day today. The first things we're stepping, uh, putting our toes into is dual purpose. One is, is we have a 4K channel on Roku, we have um, a, a desire to learn how to shoot 4K, HDR, UHD, wide color, pick all your, your acronyms of the day. Uh, so we've actually starting to build a pretty good archive of this material. Um, we're actually we're above 19 and four now, but uh, th these shows are coming out and they're looking really good and we're starting to learn a lot about that part of it too. So while I know a lot of the conversation here today is around ATSC 3.0 and the RF world, we've also got to feed the animal and we're getting into uh, learning a lot about that. Uh, this is our lab. We are uh, not nearly as pretty as the, the setups that have come out of CBS when we were doing the testing there. But we've been learning a lot about um, the differences of color space. You know, there's a lot. There's a lot of times you can read and try to understand things, but until you really start touching and playing with stuff, and that's going to become a, a recurring theme of mine, is that you don't really realize some of the gotchas till you get into it. Um, if you don't announce the color space you're in, there isn't a piece of test gear out there that's going to tell you what it was shot in. Because just because it goes out of the 709 triangle doesn't mean it's in 2020 space. It could be shot in 2020 space, it could be shot in 709 space, it could be shot in somebody's magic LUT that they made on their own. So unless you're able to start signaling and then there's a lot of little moving parts that you, all, you, you don't really realize you're going to stub your toe on until you get into it. So as we went through a bunch of testing, we compared, um, did a lot of comparisons as well of shooting in 4K, uh, shooting in HDR um, versus what it looks like when you down convert that to SDR versus shooting it in SDR uh, and you know and trying to decide whether did it did it fall into the same world as we did when we did analog um, and we jumped to HD people would say well why are you doing HD when everybody's watching an analog because what we are finding is that it is down converting better it's cleaner it falls in the realm of if you start better you end better uh, so we, we have settled on everything at the studio now, with the exception of news, everything we do is in um, uh, high dynamic range and 4K, and then we down convert for what it's going out as. So another thing we've interestingly realized, I'm not going to say discovered, because it's pretty obvious once you slow down and think about it, but we didn't really think about it. 
until this shot came back uh, from one of the photographers. And I asked him to go out and I said, just shoot stuff without touching the camera. Just turn it on and hit go. Don't adjust lighting, don't set up lights, don't do anything. So this is a shot of a local bar. Anybody's been to Raleigh, it's a 42nd Street Oyster Bar. Um, if you notice on the right, and this projector is not doing it justice, um, on the right you've got the fluorescent lights of the kitchen, bright white, white kitchen, white lights, and the back wall of that is a tile wall. And you can make out all the detail on that tile wall. Or if you go to the left hand of the screen, again, this unfortunately this projector is not doing it justice, you've got that the fluorescent light in the dark and the people's faces on the left hand of the screen, you can see all the detail in them. Um, I think what we're really going to find is, especially in high dynamic range, and maybe not as potentially, uh, it doesn't apply necessarily to wide color, but the dynamic range is going to make shooting a lot easier, especially when we get into ENG and we start chasing stuff. We're gonna be able to go out, hit, hit the camera, come back. The average photographer is going to have three or four of his personal favorite LUTs. I drop my dark LUT on it, look up table for, for mapping the color and mapping the, uh, um, the, the lighting. Um, and it's going to be a lot faster than them lugging around equipment. I think we're going to see the one-man band and the, the, the running gun uh, products start looking better because of it. Uh, so I'm down to my summaries. I have some odd thoughts. Uh, first off, it works. It really does work. Matt was able to drive around with it. Uh, we've been going through parking garages. We've been trying a lot of stuff. We've, we've not gotten into the detailed amount of um, driving and radials we want to do. A lot of the, a lot of it's because the repack got in the way. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, that's just a certain amount of time that gets sucked up by anybody that's playing with RF. A um, couple of little odd observations. Uh, if you're using a software-defined radio, and you take an upgrade to it, uh, it's going to potentially change everything you had on your signal noise and none of your uh, parameters from the previous one. Chase that for a couple of days wondering what the hell happened with the transmitter. No, the radio had different different settings in it, or the, the receiver. That was in the deck tech card. They just had a software update and it changed what their thresholds were. And so how it reported was like one of those, we wonder what we did wrong. Then we put the old software back on it, it was right back where it was. So. Um, it's been fun watching new players get into the industry. So we have our old favorites, you know, the, the Trivinis and the Gateses and the Harmonics, but you start mixing in the Anensis and the, the Cupixos and the, uh, the various players in the industry. Um, there's, I've been watching cross-learning going on. It's been very fun to see uh, a little bit of a new flavor coming into what we do and how we do it, because a lot of things that we think about, we realize we've been doing it that way just because we always have. Uh, a lot of the new tools that have been coming into our toolbox now are completely unheard of tools that I you know, hadn't thought about. We use for all kinds of other things like FFmpeg or um, um, FFmpeg for uh, uh, you know, file-based uh, making files, Wireshark for grabbing, grabbing captures, VLC for playing stuff back. Um, the biggest thing that I could say to anybody in here, especially broadcasters, is if your guys aren't up to speed on networking, now's the time to get them up to speed on networking because there is RF is RF is RF. This stuff works, but RF is the smallest part of ATSC 3.0, and I hope I'm not insulting anybody there, but it, it really is. The RF works, right? The laws of physics haven't changed. Um, what else do I have here? It's been interesting on chicken and uh, I have a chicken and the egg observation in that we've got some of our favorite uh, manufacturers saying Could we get some streams and we're saying back to them saying well we'd make some streams if you told us what the receiver needed to look for well we can't make a receiver till you get us some streams well I don't know what stream to make because I don't have a receiver so it's uh, it's definitely we're, we're still early in this uh, learning a lot about HLG versus PQ for in the production environment um, spend some time um, looking at how uh, one of the, the networks, uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say it, but one of the networks I visited, um, they went through a lot of work about how they were doing uh, one of the sports events. And the, the simplicity of HLG is gonna make you go, hmm, there's something to think about there. Um, from a business point of view, I think it was touched on in the previously, I'm not even gonna go into our thoughts on that, but you'd have to ask yourself, what is your 
your audience when you broadcast and I call all the mod CODs we're talking about really is, is a balloon. You get X number of data cells in your broadcast. How are you going to use those cells? How are you going to do your mod CODs to get your signal out? Because there's still only so much air in that balloon, so no matter where you squeeze it to feed whatever, if you squeeze it too much, you're going to break the balloon, you're not going to broadcast. So you've got to figure out what your business model is and start thinking about it now and start talking about it now. Um, it's really, I guess I'm, you know, there's, there's lots more I could talk about. Uh, I like this quote. This came in um, from one of the guys in, uh, in our IT department. The world is packets. We just happen to live in it. So start thinking that way. I mean, ATS C3O is nothing but an IP delivery system. It's a 2,000 foot flamethrower of an IP delivery system, but you know, at a megawatt of IP, I mean, that's kind of fun. Um, and this goes back to what I was just saying too. These uh, came out of a couple of my guys. Um, you know, <laughs> and he didn't say screwing. Um, he learned a lot more in a half a day of screwing with the, he didn't say crap either, screwing with this crap than I did in months of reading about it. I mean, it really is. You've got to touch it, you've got to play with it, you've got to get out there. Anybody is welcome to come down to Raleigh and play. Um, we've opened our doors to everyone. And one of my favorite ones that I asked Matt last week as I was writing this up, I said, so, okay, a year later, what would you do different now than we did a year ago to, to put this on the air? And he looked at me, he says, I still don't know enough yet to tell you what I would have done different. So it is, we're picking up speed. It's cool, it works, but there's a lot of learning to be done. Um, and just my thanks to my guys, Matt, Mike, and Josh, and uh, the whole 39 club that was there. So thank you very much. And I'm not in the way of beer. I got five minutes. Questions? Oh dear. Oh dear. No. I assume you're operating on an STA on channel 39. Yes. What are your plans for a <laughs> transition with your other markets or your other stations? Uh, the plans for the transition. Yep. We got a plan. <laughs> Uh, so channel 39 is obviously it's a one-off. Uh, there is not a plan for that yet. We're waiting for the maximization round to finish um, for uh, obviously for the repack to see what's left. I'd like to be able to change the channel. We did buy a, a wideband antenna. The, the RI will do the, the whole lower part of the band. Um, Nick's filter will retune. So in the, the gates transmitter will retune. As for the transition, is that what you meant by the transition plan? Okay. Not the 3.0 transition plan? The 3.0 transition. The 3.0 transition plan, we're going to work with all of our partners to come up with the single best idea that we ever had, and we're going to implement it all <laughs> the same day, and it's going to be wonderful, and rainbows and roses are going to come out of all the unicorns. 